Chapter 3. Sanjiro, Lord of Satsuma, eyes slitted and pitiless, a heavy set, bearded man of forty-two, his swords priceless, his blue over mantle, the finest silk looked at his most trusted adviser. Was the attack a good thing or a bad thing? It was good, sire, Katsumata said softly, knowing there were spies everywhere. The two men were alone, kneeling opposite each other, in the best quarters of an inn at Hodegaya, a village way station on the Tokaido, barely two miles inland from the settlement. Why? For six centuries Sanjiro's ancestors had ruled Satsuma, the richest and most powerful fief in all Japan, except for those of his hated enemies, the Toranunga clans, and, as zealously, had guarded its independence. It will create trouble between the shogunate and Gaijin, Katsumata said. He was a thin, steel-hard man, a master swordsman and the most famous of all sensei, teachers, of martial arts in Satsuma province. The more those dogs are in conflict the sooner they will clash, the sooner the clash the better, for that will help bring down the Toranagas and their puppets at last, and let you install a new shogunate, a new shogun, new officials, with Satsuma preeminent and yourself one of a new roju. Roju was another name for the council of five elders that ruled in the name of the shogun. One of the roju, why only one? Sanjiro thought secretly, why not chief minister, why not shogun, I have all the necessary lineage. Two and a half centuries of Toranunga shoguns is more than enough. Nobusada, the fourteenth, should be the last, by my father's head, will be the last. This shogunate had been established by the warlord Toranunga in 1603 after winning the Battle of Sekigahara, where his legions took 40,000 enemy heads. With Sekigahara he eliminated all practical opposition and, for the first time in history, had subdued Nippon, the land of the gods, as Japanese called their country, and brought it under one rule. At once this brilliant general and administrator, now holding absolute temporal power, gratefully accepted the title shogun, the highest rank a mortal could have, from a powerless emperor, which confirmed him, legally, as dictator. Quickly he made his shogunate hereditary, at once decreeing that, in future, all temporal matters were the sole province of the shogun, all spiritual matters the emperor's. For the last eight centuries the emperor, the son of heaven, and his court had lived in seclusion in the walled imperial palace at Kyoto. Once a year, only, he came outside the walls to visit the sacred eyes shrine, but even then he was hidden from all eyes, his face never seen in public. Even inside the walls he was screened from all but his most immediate family by zealous, hereditary officials and ancient, mystic protocols. Thus the warlord who had physical possession of the palace gates decided who went in and who came out, had de facto possession of the emperor and his ear, and thus his influence and power. And though all Japanese absolutely believed him to be divine, and accepted him as the son of heaven, and descended from the sun goddess in an unbroken line since time began, by historic custom the emperor and his court retained no armies, and had no revenue other than that granted by the warlord at his gates, yearly at the man's whim. For decades Shogun Toranunga, his son and grandson, ruled with wise though ruthless control. Following generations loosened their hold, lesser officials usurped more and more power, gradually making their own offices hereditary too. The Shogun remained titular head but, over a century or more, had become a puppet, but always and only selected from the Toranunga line, as was the Council of Elders. The present shogun, Nobusada, was chosen four years ago when he was twelve. And not long for this earth, Sanjiro promised himself, and came back to the present problem which disturbed him. Katsumata, the killings, though merited, may provoke the guy Jin too much and that would be bad for Satsuma. I do not see any bad, sire. The emperor wants the guy Jin expelled, as you do, as do most daimyos. That the two samurai are Satsumas will also please the emperor. Do not forget your mission to Yedo was accomplished perfectly. Three months ago Sanjiro had persuaded Emperor Kome, through intermediaries at the imperial court in Kyoto, 
personally to sign several wishes Sanjiro had suggested, and to appoint him escort to an imperial messenger who would formally deliver the scroll in Yedo which would ensure its acceptance. Wish of the emperor, if accepted, was difficult to refuse, sometimes. For the last two months he had led the negotiations and as much as the elders and their Bakufu officials twisted and turned, he had dominated them and now had their written assent to certain reforms bound to weaken the whole shogunate. Importantly he now had their formal consent to cancel the hated treaties, signed against the emperor's wishes, to expel the hated Gai Jin and to close the land as it was before the unwelcome arrival and forced entry of Peri. Meanwhile, what about those two fools who broke ranks and killed without orders? Sanjiro asked. Any act that embarrasses the Bakufu helps you. I agree the Gai Jin were provocative. Those vermin had no right to be anywhere near me. My banner and the imperial banner were in the front rank forbidding it. So let the Gai Jin bear the consequences of their act. They force their way onto our shores against our wishes and have the Yokohama foothold. With the men we have now, and a surprise attack by night, we could obliterate the settlement and burn the surrounding villages easily. We could do it tonight and solve the problem permanently. Yokohama, yes, with a sudden attack. But we cannot get at their fleets, we cannot squash them and their cannon. Yes, sire, and the Gai Jin would retaliate at once. Their fleet would bombard Yedo and destroy it. I agree, and the sooner the better. But that would not destroy the shogunate and after Yedo, they would go against me, they would attack my capital, Kagoshima. I cannot risk that. I believe Yedo would satisfy them, sire. If their base is burnt, they would have to go back aboard their ships and sail away, back to Hong Kong. Sometime in the future they may come back, but then they must land in strength to erect a new base. Worse for them, they must use land forces to maintain it. They humbled China. Their war machine is invincible. This isn't China and we are not mealy-mouthed, cowardly Chinese to be bled to death or frightened to death by these carrion. They say they just want to trade. Good. You want to trade too, for guns, cannon and ships. Katsumata smiled and added delicately, I suggest if we burn and destroy Yokohama, of course, we pretend the attack is at the Bakufu's request, the Shogun's request, when the Gai Jin return, whoever controls the Shogunate then would reluctantly agree to pay a modest indemnity and, in return, the Gai Jin will happily agree to tear up the shameful treaties and trade on any terms we decide to impose. They would attack us at Kagoshima, Sanjiro said. We could not repel them. Our bay is hazardous for shipping, not open like Yedo. We have secret shore batteries, secret Dutch cannon, we grow stronger every month. Such an act of war by Gai Jin would unite all daimyo, all samurai, and the whole land into an irresistible force under your banner. Gai Jin armies cannot win on land. This is the land of the gods, the gods will come to our aid too, Katsumata said fervently, not believing it at all, manipulating Sanjiro as he had done for years. A divine wind, a kamikaze wind, destroyed the armadas of the Mongol Kublai Khan 600 years ago, why not again? True, Sanjiro said, the gods saved us then. But Gai Jin are Gai Jin and vile and who knows what mischief they can invent. Foolish to invite a sea attack until we've warships. Though, yes, the gods are on our side and will protect us. Katsumata laughed to himself. There are no gods, any gods, or heaven, or life after death. Stupid to believe otherwise, stupid Gai Jin and their stupid dogma. I believe what the great dictator general Nakamura said in his death poem, from nothing into nothing, Osaka castle and all that I have ever done is but a dream within a dream. The Gai Jin settlement is within your grasp like never before. Those two youths awaiting judgment pointed away. I beg you take it. He hesitated and dropped his voice even more. Rumor has it, sire, secretly they are Shishi. Sanjiro's eyes narrowed even more. Shishi, men of spirit, so called because of their bravery and deeds, were young revolutionaries who were spearheading an unheard of revolt against the shogunate.
They were a recent phenomenon, thought to number only about a hundred and fifty throughout the land. To the shogunate and most daimyos they were terrorists and madmen to be stamped out. To most samurai, particularly rank and file warriors, they were loyalists waging an all-consuming battle for good, wanting to force the Toranagas to relinquish the shogunate and restore all power to the emperor, from whom, they fervently believed, it had been usurped by the warlord Toranunga two and a half centuries ago. To many commoners and peasants and merchants, and particularly to the floating world of geishas and pleasure houses, shishi were the stuff of legends, sung about, wept over, and adored. All were samurai, young idealists, the majority coming from the fiefs of Satsuma, Choshu and Tosa, a few were fanatic xenophobes, most were ronin, wave men, because they were as free as the waves, masterless samurai, or samurai who had been outcast by their lord for disobedience, or a crime, and had fled their province to escape punishment, or those who had fled by choice, believing in a new, outrageous heresy, that there could be a higher duty than that due their lord, or their family, a duty to the ruling emperor alone. A few years ago the growing Shishi movement had formed themselves into small, secret cells, committing themselves to rediscover Bushido, ancient samurai practices of self-discipline, duty, honor, death, swordsmanship and other warlike pursuits, arts long since lost, except for a few sensei who had kept Bushido alive. Lost because for the last two and a half centuries Japan had been at peace under rigid Toranunga rule that forbade warlike pursuits, where, for centuries before, there had been total civil war. Cautiously the Shishi began to meet and discuss and to plan. Swords manship schools became centers of discontent. Zealots and radicals appeared in their midst, some good, some bad. But one common thread joined them. All were fanatically anti-shogunate, and opposed to allowing Japanese ports to be open to foreigners and foreign trade. To this end, for the last four years, they had waged sporadic attacks on Gaijin, and begun to articulate an unprecedented, all-out revolt against the legal ruler, Shogun Nobusada, the all-powerful council of elders and Bakufu that in theory did his bidding, regulating all aspects of life. The Shishi had conjured up an all-embracing slogan, Sono Joy, honor the emperor and expel the barbarians, and had sworn, whatever the cost, to remove anyone in the way. Even if they are Shishi, Sanjiro said angrily, I cannot allow such a public disobedience to go unpunished, however merited, I agreed those Gai Jin should have dismounted and knelt, as customary, and behaved like civilized persons, yes, it was they who provoked my men. But that does not excuse those two. I agree, Sire, then give me your advice, he said irritably. If they're shishi as you say and I crush them, or order them to commit seppuku, I will be assassinated before the month is out, however many my guards, don't attempt to deny it, I know. Disgusting their power is so strong though most are common goshi. Perhaps that is their strength, Sire, Katsumata had replied. Goshi were the lowest rank of samurai their families mostly penniless country samurai, hardly more than the warrior peasants of olden times with almost no hope of getting an education, therefore no hope of advancement, no hope of getting their views acted upon, or even heard by officials of low rank, let alone daimyo. They've nothing to lose but their lives. If anyone has a grievance I listen, of course I listen. Special men get special education, some of them. Why not allow him to lead the attack on the Gai Jin? And if there is no attack, I cannot hand him over to the Bakufu, unthinkable, or to the Gai Jin. Most Shishi are just young idealists, without brains or purpose. A few are troublemakers and outlaws who are not needed on this earth. However, some could be valuable, if used correctly. A spy told me the oldest, Shoran, was part of the team that assassinated Chief Minister E. Sir Carr, this had occurred four years ago. Against all advice, he, who was responsible for maneuvering the boy Nobusada to be shogun, had also suggested a highly improper marriage between the boy and the emperor's twelve-year-old half-sister, and, worst of all, had negotiated and signed the hated treaties. 
His passing was not regretted, especially by Sanjiro. Send for them. Now in the audience room a maid was serving Sanjiro tea. Katsumata sat beside him. Around stood ten of his personal bodyguard. All were armed. The two youths kneeling below and in front of him were not, though their swords lay on the tatami within easy reach. Their nerves were stretched but they showed none of it. The maid bowed and left, hiding her fear. Sanjiro did not notice her going. He lifted the exquisite little porcelain cup from the tray, sipped the tea. The tea's taste was good to him and he was glad to be ruler and not ruled, pretending to study the cup, admiring it, his real attention on the youths. They waited impassively, knowing the time had come. He knew nothing about them except what Katsumata had told him. That both were Goshi, foot soldiers like their fathers before them. Each had a stipend of one koku yearly, a measure of dry rice, about five bushels, considered enough to feed one family for one year. Both came from villages near Kagoshima. One was nineteen, the other, who had been wounded and now had his arm bound, was seventeen. Both had been to the select samurai school at Kagoshima that gave extra training, including studies of carefully chosen Dutch manuals, which he had begun twenty years ago for those showing special aptitudes. Both had been good students, both were unmarried, both spent their spare time perfecting their swordsmanship and learning. Both were eligible for promotion sometime in the future. The older was called Shoran Anatu, the younger Ori Ryoma. The silence became heavier. Abruptly he began talking to Katsumata as though the two youths did not exist. If any of my men, however worthy, however much provoked, whatever the reason, were to commit a violent act that I had not authorized and they remained within my reach, I would certainly have to deal with them severely. Yes, sire. He saw the glint in his counselor's eyes. Stupid to be disobedient. If such men wanted to remain alive their only recourse would be to flee and become ronin, even if they were to lose their stipends. A waste of their lives if they happened to be worthy. Then he looked at the youths, scrutinizing him carefully. To his surprise he saw nothing on their faces, just the same grave impassivity. His caution increased. You are quite correct, sire. As always. Katsumata added, it might be that some such men, if special men of honor, knowing that they had disturbed your harmony, knowing you would have no other option than to punish them severely, these special men even as Ronan would still guard your interests, perhaps even forward your interests. Such men do not exist, Sanjiro said, secretly delighted his counselor agreed with him. He turned his pitiless eyes onto the young men. Do they? Both youths tried to maintain their direct gaze but they were overwhelmed. They dropped their glance. Shoran, the older, muttered, There, there are such men, sire. The silence became rougher as Sanjiro waited for the other youth to declare himself also. Then the younger Ori nodded his bowed head imperceptibly, put both hands flat on the tatami and bowed lower. Yes, lord, I agree. Sanjiro was content, for now, at no cost, he had their allegiance and two spies within the movement, whom Katsumata would be answerable for. Such men would be useful, if they existed. His voice was curt and final. Katsumata, write an immediate letter to the Bakufu, informing them two Goshi called, he thought a moment, paying no attention to the rustle in the room, put whatever names you like, broke ranks and killed some Gai Jin today because of their provocative and insolent attitude. The Gai Jin were armed with pistols which they pointed threateningly at my palanquin. These two men, provoked, as all my men were, escaped before they could be caught and bound. He looked back at the youths. As to you two, you will both come back at the first night watch for sentencing. Katsumata said quickly, Sire, May I suggest you add in the letter that they have been ordered outcast, declared Ronan, their stipends cancelled and a reward offered for their heads. Two Koku, post it in their villages when we return. Sanjiro turned his eyes on Shoran and Ori and waved his hand in dismissal. They bowed deeply and left. He was pleased to see the sweat on the back of their kimonos though the afternoon was not hot. Katsumata, about Yokohama, he said softly when they were alone again. 
send some of our best spies to see what is going on there. Order them to be back here by nightfall, and order all samurai to become battle ready. Yes, sire. Katsumata did not allow a smile to show. When the youths left Sanjiro and had passed through the rings of bodyguards, Katsumata caught up with them. Follow me. He led the way through meandering gardens to a side door that was unguarded. Go at once to Kanagawa, to the Inn of the Midnight Blossoms. It is a safe house, other friends will be there. Hurry, but, Sensei, Ori said. First we must collect our other swords and armor and money and... Silence. Angrily Katsumata reached into his kimono sleeve and gave them a small purse with a few coins in it. Take this, and return double for your insolence. At sunset I will order men to go after you with orders to kill you if you're caught within one ri. A ri was about a league, about three miles. Yes, sensei, I apologize for being so rude. Your apology is not accepted. You are both fools. You should have killed all four barbarians, not just one. Particularly the girl, for that would have sent the guy Jin mad with rage. How many times have I told you? They're not civilized like us, and view the world, religion and women differently. You're inept. You're fools. You initiated a good attack then failed to press forward ruthlessly without concern for your own lives. You hesitated. So you lost. Fools. He said again. You forgot everything I've taught you. Enraged, he backhanded Shoran in the face, the blow savage. At once Shoran bowed, mumbled an abject apology for causing the sensei to lose wa, to lose inner harmony, keeping his head bowed, desperately trying to contain the pain. Ori stayed ramrod stiff, waiting for the second blow. It left a livid burn in its wake. Immediately he, too, apologized abjectly, and kept his throbbing head bowed, afraid. Once a fellow student, the best swordsman amongst them, had answered Katsumata rudely during a practice fight. Without hesitation, Katsumata had sheathed his sword, attacked barehanded, disarmed him, humiliated him, broke both his arms and expelled him to his village forever. Please excuse me, sensei, Shoran said, meaning it. Go to the Inn of the Midnight Blossoms. When I send a message, Obey whatever I require of you at once, there will be no second chance. At once, understand. Yes, yes, sensei, please excuse me, they mumbled together, tucked up their kimonos and fled, thankful to be out of his reach, more frightened of him than of Sanjiro. Katsumata had been their main teacher for years, in both the arts of war and, in secret, other arts, strategy, past, present and of the future, why the Bakufu had failed in their duty, the Toranagas in theirs, why there must be change and how to bring it about. Katsumata was one of the few clandestine Shishi who was Hatamoto, an honored retainer with instant access to his lord, a senior samurai with a personal yearly stipend of a thousand koku. Eee, to be so rich, Shoran had whispered to Ori when they had first found out. Money is nothing, nothing. The sensei says when you have power you don't need money. I agree, but think of your family, your father and mine, and grandfather, they could buy some land of their own and not have to work the fields of others, nor would we have to work like that from time to time to earn extra. You're right, Ori said. Then Shoran had laughed. No need to worry, We'll never get even a hundred koku and if we had it we'd just spend our share on girls and sake and become daimyos of the floating world. A thousand koku is all the money in the world. No, it's not, Ori had said. Don't forget what the sensei told us. During one of Katsumata's secret sessions for his special group of acolytes he had said, the revenue of Satsuma amounts to 750,000 koku and belongs to our lord, the daimyo, to a portion as he sees fit. That's another custom the new administration will modify. When the great change has happened, a fief's revenue will be portioned out by a council of state, made up of wise men drawn from any rank of samurai, high or low, of any age, provided the man has the necessary wisdom and has proved himself a man of honor. It will be the same in all fiefs, 
as the land will be governed by a Supreme Council of State in Yedo or Kyoto, drawn equally from Samurai of Honor, under the guidance of the Son of Heaven. Sensei, you said any. May I ask, will that include the Toranagas? Ori had asked, there will be no exception, if the man is worthy. Sensei, please, about the Toranagas. Does anyone know their real wealth, the lands they really control? After Sekigahara, Toranunga took lands from dead enemies worth yearly about five million koku, about a third of all the wealth of Nippon, for himself and his family. In perpetuity. In the stunned silence that followed, Ori had said for all of them, with that amount of wealth we could have the greatest navy in the world with all the men of war and cannon and guns we could ever need, we could have the best legions with the best guns, we could throw out all gaijin. We could even carry war to them and extend our shores, Katsumata had added softly, and correct previous shame. At once they had known he was referring to the Tyro, General Nakamura, Toranunga's immediate predecessor and liege lord, the great peasant general who then possessed the gates and had therefore, in gratitude, been granted by the emperor the highest possible title a lowborn could aspire to, Tyro, meaning dictator, not that of shogun, which he coveted to obsession but could never have. Having subdued all the land, chiefly by persuading his main enemy Toranunga to swear allegiance to him and his child heir forever, he had gathered a huge armada and mounted a vast campaign against Chosen, or Korea as it was sometimes called, to enlighten that country and use it as a stepping stone to the dragon throne of China. But his armies had failed and soon retreated in ignominy, as in previous eras, centuries before, two other Japanese attempts had failed, equally in disaster, the throne of China a perpetual lodestone. Such shame needs to be eradicated, like the shame the sons of heaven have suffered because of the Toranagas who usurped Nakamura's power when the man died, destroyed his wife and son, leveled their Osaka castle, and have pillaged the heritage of the son of heaven for long enough. Sono joy, sono joy, they had echoed, fervently, in the dusk the youths were tiring, their headlong flight racking them but neither wanted to be the first to admit it so they pressed on until they were at the threshold of woods. Ahead now were paddy swamps on either side of the Takedo that led to the outskirts of Kanagawa just ahead, and to the roadblock. The shore was to their right. Let's, let's stop a moment, Ori said, his wounded arm throbbing, head hurting, chest hurting, but not showing it. All right. Shoran was panting as hard and hurting as much but he laughed. You're weak, like an old woman. He picked a dry patch of earth, sat down gratefully. With great care B began to look around, trying to regain his breathing. The Takedo was almost empty, night travel being generally forbidden by the Bakufu and subject to severe cross-questioning and punishment if not justified. Several porters and the last of the travelers scurried for the Kanagawa barrier, all others safely bathing or carousing at the inns of their choice, of which there was a multitude within the post towns. Throughout the land, trunk road barriers closed at nightfall and were not opened until dawn, and always guarded by local samurai. Across the bay Shoran could see the oil lamps along the promenade and in some of the houses of the settlement, and amongst the ships at anchor. A good moon, half full, was rising from near the horizon. How is your arm, Ori? Fine, Shoran. We are more than a re from Hodegaia. Yes, but I won't feel safe until we're at the inn. Shoran began massaging his neck to try to ease the pain there and in his head. Katsumata's blow had stunned him. When we were before Lord Sanjiro I thought we were finished, I thought he was going to condemn us. So did I, as he spoke Ori felt sick, his arm throbbing like his heaving chest, his face still afire. With his good hand he waved absently at a swarm of night insects. If he, I was ready to go for my sword and send him on before us. So was I but the sensei was watching very closely and he would have killed both of us before we moved. Yes, you're right again. The younger man shuddered. His blow almost took my head off. Eee, to have such strength, unbelievable. 
I'm glad he's on our side, not against us. He saved us, only him. He bent Lord Sanjiro to his will. Ori was suddenly somber. Shoran, while I was waiting I, to keep myself strong, I composed my death poem. Shoran became equally grave. May I hear it? Yes. Sono joy at sunset. Nothing wasted. Into nothing. I spring. Shoran thought about the poem, savoring it, the balance of the words and the third level of meaning. Then he said solemnly, it is wise for a samurai to have composed a death poem. I haven't managed that yet but I should, then all the rest of life is extra. He twisted his head from side to side to the limit, the joints or ligaments cracking, and he felt better. You know, Ori, the sensei was right. We did hesitate, therefore we lost. I hesitated, he's right in that, I could have killed the girl easily but she paralyzed me for a moment. I've never, her outlandish clothes, her face like a strange flower with that huge nose more like a monstrous orchid with two great blue spots and crowned with yellow stamens, those unbelievable eyes, Siamese cat eyes and thatch of straw under that ridiculous hat, so repulsive yet so, so attracting. Ori laughed nervously. I was bewitched. She is surely a kami from the dark regions. Rip her clothes off and she'd be real enough, but how attractive I. I don't know. I thought of that too, wondering what it would be like. Ori looked up at the moon for a moment. If I pillowed with her I think. I think I'd become the male spider to her female. You mean she'd kill you afterwards? Yes, if I pillowed her, with or without force, that woman would kill me. Ori waved the air, the insects becoming a pestilence. I've never seen one like her, nor have you. You noticed too, nay. No, everything happened so fast and I was trying to kill the big ugly one with the pistol and then she had fled. Ori stared at the faint lights of Yokohama. I wonder what she's called, what she did when she got back there. I've never seen. She was so ugly and yet. Shoran was unsettled. Normally Ori hardly noticed women, just used them when he had a need, let them entertain him, serve him. Apart from his adored sister, he could not remember Ori ever discussing one before. Karma. Yes, karma. Ori shifted his bandage to be more comfortable, but the throbbing deepened. Blood seeped from under it. Even so, I do not know if we lost. We must wait, we must be patient and see what will happen. We always planned to go against Gai Jin at the first opportunity. I was right to go against them at that moment. Shoran got up. I'm tired of seriousness, and Kami and death. We'll know death soon enough. The sensei gave us life for Sono Joy. From nothing into nothing, but tonight we've another night to enjoy. A bath, sake, food, then a real lady of the night, succulent and sweet-smelling and moist. He laughed softly. A flower, not an orchid, with a beautiful nose and proper eyes. Let's, he stopped. Eastwards, from the direction of Yokohama, came the echoing report of a ship's signal cannon. Then a signal rocket briefly lit the darkness. Is that usual? I don't know. Ahead they could just see the lamps at the first barrier. Through the paddy is better, then we can skirt the guards. Yes, better we cross the road here and go closer to the shore. They won't expect intruders that way, we can avoid any patrols, and the inn is nearer. They ran across the road, keeping well down, then up onto one of the paths that transverse the fields recently planted with winter rice. Suddenly they stopped. From the Tokaido came the clatter of approaching horses and jingling harness. They ducked down, waited a moment, then gasped. Ten uniformed dragoons, armed with carbines and led by an officer, canted out of the curve. At once the soldiers were spotted by samurai at the barrier, who called out a warning. Others rushed from the huts to join them. Soon there were twenty lined up behind the barrier, an officer at their head. What shall we do, Ori? Shoran whispered. Wait. As they watched the senior samurai held up his hand. Stop. He called out, then nodded slightly instead of a bow, correct etiquette from a superior to an inferior. Is your night travel authorized? If so please give me the papers. 
Ori's fury soared as he saw the open insolence of the Gai Jin officer who halted about ten paces from the barrier, called out something in his strange language and imperiously motioned to the samurai to open it, neither dismounting nor bowing courteously as custom demanded. How dare you be so rude? Leave, the samurai said angrily, not expecting the insult, waving him away. The Gai Jin officer barked an order. At once his men unslung their carbines, leveled them at the samurai, then on an abrupt second order, fired a disciplined volley into the air. At once they reloaded and aimed directly at the guards, almost before the sound of the volley had died away, leaving a vast ominous silence throughout the landscape. Shoran and Ori gasped, for all time guns had been muzzle-loaded with powder and shot. Those are breech-loading rifles, with the new cartridges, Shoran whispered excitedly. Neither had ever seen these recent inventions, had only heard of them. The samurai were equally shocked. Eee, -e -e, did you notice how fast they reloaded? I heard a soldier can easily fire ten rounds to one of a muzzle loader. But did you see the discipline, Shoran, and that of the horses? They hardly moved. Once more the Gai Jin officer haughtily motioned them to open the barrier, no mistaking the threat that if he was not obeyed quickly, all the samurai were dead. Let them through, the senior samurai said. The dragoon officer disdainfully spurred forward, apparently without fear, his grim-faced men following, their guns ready. None of them acknowledged the guards or returned their polite bows. This will be reported at once and an apology demanded. The samurai said, enraged with their insulting behavior, trying not to show it. Once they had passed through, the barrier was replaced and Ori whispered furiously, what foul manners. But against those guns what could he do? He should have charged and killed them before he died. I could not do what that coward did. I would have charged and died, Shoran said, knees trembling with anger. Yes, I think. Ori stopped, his own anger evaporating at his sudden thought. Come on, he whispered urgently. We'll find out where they're going. Perhaps we can steal some of those guns.